electrical engineering. And so actually, Dr. Reznikov has worn many hats in the scientific world. He started originally as a dentist and then got a master's from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, did a PhD at the Weizmann Institute studying collagen structure, and then did a couple of postdocs at Imperial College London and at McGill in the Faculty of Dentistry. And then she actually spent a couple of years working in industry at Montreal-based Object Research Systems, or ORS, whose main product I think she will touch on today. And, then, and in 2020, she joined the McGill Department of Bioengineering and shortly thereafter joined the QLS family. So it is my privilege to introduce my supervisor, Dr. Natalie Rajnikov. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. This is very kind. So uh, uh, let me pedal my way. Uh, <laughs> so everybody here, I guess, uh, um, oh, oh, yeah, uh, knows what bones are for, right? So in terrestrial mammals, uh, bones uh, evolved to pro propel against gravity and to protect innards. And as a general rule, uh, bones that support heavy loads are more robust and bones that are uh, supporting uh, more uh, delicate loads such as this uh, nasal bones and the boreal seal, they're more uh, gracile. And uh, that is a kind of a, a big evolutionary picture um, uh, confirming that paradigm that uh, form follows function. In bones, uh, uh, pretty much, uh, well, nothing is <laughs> is wasted and nothing exists for no purpose. So uh, form follows function. Now, if we uh, look inside, uh, in nearly any bone, any long bone, near the ends where bones articulate with each other, we will find a meshwork of trabecular elements. And uh, uh, there, of course, there are some species uh, related variations and uh, 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 individual variations. And uh, that uh, uh, can be further analyzed at uh, kind of mechanical level and uh, mechanistic uh, level. So, uh, about 10 years ago, when I was a PhD student myself, uh, at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, I and my, uh, my uh, uh, buddy and fellow student, uh, Jonathan Bensby, uh, uh, we decided to analyze how bones, how trabecular bone inside the jaw responds to compressive loading. And because both of us were heavily primed in human anatomy and we were both dentists by uh, trade, uh, we decided that uh, it, the simplest model to to, uh, to look at bone structure uh, and connect it to the loading history would be to get a human jaw and uh, 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 maybe sample a few trabecular struts uh, from right below the teeth and, uh, and look at, at the inner structure of these elements uh, using various ways of microscopic analysis. So uh, we couldn't get a human mandible for various reasons. But we were lucky enough to get a pig mandible. And the, the sizes of a human and the pig mandible are pretty much to scale on the, uh, on the slide. So the, the pig jaw is just this big. And uh, we had to cut it into bits to accommodate it inside an X-ray scanner. So we cut it in two halves and were prepared to collect lots of trabecular bone to have enough for our analysis, maybe for entire Yonton's PhD. And to our surprise and disbelief, we found that instead of a, a dense, intricate trabecular network inside, there was a hole. And uh, so, well, essentially there was nothing to analyze. And uh, uh, usually uh, this geometry exists in long bones, like in your femur or in your shoulder bone. Uh, like a, a, a circular tube. And then the pig bone, it extended from the molars to the inside. Why pigs have a, a, a femur in their mouth? Uh, well, uh, classic beam theory is teaching us that this geometry of a hollow pipe with relatively solid walls is a perfect adaptation to withstand bending. But we wanted to analyze compressive loading and bone response to compressive loads. 
So that was against the paradigm. The answer, however, uh, we uh, uncovered fairly soon after uh, Googling the lifestyle of pigs. Pigs uh, actually <laughs> dig in the soil to, to get acorns and uh, tubers, and they use their mandibles as like a shovel. And uh, that imparts a significant bending momentum on the, uh, on the mandibular body. And that explains perfectly fine this uh, structural adaptation to uh, function. And uh, uh, yet, within a, a, a single bone where we do find trabecular uh, spongy bone fabric, uh, there, there is a lot of things to, to focus on. The uh, trabecular elements can be uh, fine or coarse or uniform or uh, delicate or or fusing together to form something that looks like gothic arches uh, until they finally blend with the, uh, with the shaft of a long bone to convey the uh, imparted mechanical forces. So uh, still we didn't know at the time uh, how we can describe this structure, structure function relation. But uh, to zoom out and kind of recall the basics, uh, all uh, skeleton owning animals start their uh, life uh, from a, a very simple uh, uh, single uh, cell, right? Uh, and uh, grow from, uh, from an embryo to a full organism. So bones have to build up molecule by molecule, crystal by crystal from uh, uh, bottom to top. And uh, uh, there are several kinds of cells that are involved in the process. So there are uh, bone forming cells called osteoblasts that deposit collagenous matrix that mineralizes. And then some, some of these cells uh, remain embedded in that uh, tissue and monitor the stress field. And then there are also other cells that uh, 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 jump up this mineralized matrix where it requires to, to be reformed and remodeled. And uh, uh, this is a perfectly fine process. It's a maintenance process so that bones would remain uh, 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 tough and bouncy for the lifetime of, of an organism. So these are two balanced process. But uh, coordinated activity of bone acquisition and bone resorption can shape the uh, size and uh, uh, morphological properties uh, and uh, texture of uh, inner structure of, of bones. So uh, if we look, let's say, at a small fragment of uh, trabecular bone fabric and zoom in, we will see something like this. So here is a, a micrograph. I hope you can see with the resolution of the screen that it, it has uh, different textures of different areas, right? So here we have a flat surface at the bottom like if something has been eaten away from the uh, branching structure. And uh, then they have uh, uh, layered concentric deposits of uh, lamellar bone. And then there is something pretty much uh, uh, textureless in the center. So uh, these are all the logs of cellular activity. Uh, the area denoted by, by the asterisk for the very primary original bone formation that just hadn't had a chance to, to get remodeled and replaced by newer tissue. Where we have uh, four arrowheads pointing at that bay at the bottom surface, that is an indication that there was an active process of remodeling or uh, uh, renovation of, of the mineralized matrix going on. And where the white arrows are pointing from the bottom, these are the most recent deposits of, uh, of, of bone tissue in parallel layers. So, uh, uh, for example, we start from some generic geometry of the uh, trabecular, uh, trabecular elements connected into a 3D uh, net. And then let's say some parts selectively under the influence of mechanical forces uh, get reduced and removed from the picture and where we have preferential opposition, that would be indicative of a certain orientation of uh, prevalent forces acting on that uh, local piece of tissue. And uh, uh, alternatively, if another direction prevails then other areas can be uh, remodeled, reworked and uh, uh, redeposited. Indeed, if uh, 
we look how here's a picture from a from a, a paper in Frontiers uh, featuring the texture of human bone in the in the vertebrates. So uh, we are all born as pretty much as generalists uh, without any specialization to a particular way of functioning, right? So uh, it's quite uniform and uh, isotropic. But when it starts uh, holding hand and crawling and then walking, they, there is a preferred orientation that starts uh, uh, morphing in, in trabecular fabric, indicating that uh, most uh, 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 most strenuous loads are acting in the vertical direction. But of course, even at the age of 2.6, we cannot talk about any uh, pronounced specialization. And uh, there is a whole field that is a little bit fuzzy as to how we can get uh, loading history, uh, let's say from a prehistorical skeleton, uh, looking at uh, the muscle attachment sites and analyzing these uh, um, logs of uh, preferential opposition of bone. Uh, and uh, deriving the load field that uh, would be inducing these the changes in life. So uh, an isotropy or preferred orientation of structural elements in particular direction has long been, been used as a, as a proxy of both specialization. It would just take a one anatomical site pretty average in, in each of our femurs here. Uh, within a few millimeters uh, uh, different areas of sampling, we may find absolutely different textures. Uh, we can find trabecular elements that are all fine and delicate or all coarse or a mixture of both, oriented or not oriented. And uh, there are also some residues of uh, both plates and many bones, even an individual to complete their both. There's still some traces of prior uh, development and loading history. There are vascular canals, uh, all sorts of things. And yet, uh, traditionally, the, the way of uh, calculating an isotropy to analyze the loading history uh, has been quite uh, uh, general. So there are different ways, for example, calculating mean intercept length or of star volume distribution. And all these methods, they are, require first uh, copying the volume of interest to a sphere, because otherwise uh, the analysis would uh, uh, take into account the shape of the cropped volume. And then uh, it is pretty statistical. So to, to get a, a, a robust signal as to what is the preferred orientation of pores and struts, uh, there must be at least five or seven repeats of um, a trabecular and a pore and trabecular and a pore, uh, like in the same volume. So such classical methods uh, are um, not very robust unless uh, we totally sacrifice resolution and they're devoid of anatomical context. So, uh, and during my stint with the, uh, with the Montreal uh, company, uh, the object, the pro product of, of, of whom is the Dragonfly software, uh, we actually built a way to, to map trabecular anisotropy within its anatomical context and with a, uh, pushing a little bit the resolution of the method to a, a finer scale. Uh, so I will illustrate it using a primitive shape on the screen. So this is a parallel pipette that is stretched in the vertical direction. And we can intuitively say that this is an, an isotropic ob object. But we can also mm, uh, split the surface in standardized units of area, say triangles, and build a, a perpendicular elementary vector normal to each of these triangles. Then we count the arrows and uh, we will have two sticking upwards and 20 facing us. And uh, by kind of flipping the uh, ratio, uh, uh, taking a reciprocal, we can say that this parallel pipette is an isotropic and it is a stretch like 10 times uh, uh, in vertical direction in comparison with the horizontal direction. So once this operation works on a simple, 
surface, we can also push it to work on a complex surface. So here is a, uh, a piece of trabecular bone, which is a very complicated uh, 3D continuous surface with pores and struts. And every small uh, area can be standardized to, uh, or to uh, like triangulate it. And then we can build our elementary vectors normal to, to the triangles of the surface. So if the vectors are co-oriented within a user-defined volume of interest, they will add up. And if they're oriented in opposing directions, then they will cancel out. So we can project the, uh, within every uh, user-defined, uh, let's say, uh, millimeter uh, sphere, we can count all these elementary vectors and project them on, on uh, Cartesian coordinates and uh, uh, calculate the degree of anisotropy. So the sheep femur I showed you on the black background, dramatic, uh, yeah, we use it for a validation of the, of the method and uh, calculated a vector field of uh, 5 million vectors that describe the variation in the proximal end that connects to the pelvis. So the uh, yellow, uh, uh, blue is low anisotropy, red is high anisotropy, and uh, yellow is intermediate. And uh, we can uh, uh, filter the, the uh, color-coded vectors, and, and it becomes obvious that where this bone articulates with the pelvis, anisotropy is the lowest. That makes sense, right? Because it's a ball and socket joint and it can be loaded within that socket in any direction, depending on the uh, move, movement pattern of, of the animal. And uh, well, that's pretty logical. And where you have to wear the signal, the red arrows, that stands for continuous outer shell of the bone, which is pretty smooth. And uh, 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 this is what we expect. But vectors uh, can be plotted not only by their magnitude, but also by their direction. And if we borrow the RGB notion from crystallographers and uh, code uh, the orientation of these vectors uh, uh, along X, Y, and Z axis as uh, red, green, and blue, we will get this alternative uh, plot of the, of the uh, vector map. Here again, if we uh, focus on the on the head of the femur that articulates with the pelvis and sits in this ball and socket joint, we will have quite a, a mixed signal, right, of different orientations, which is what we expect from a moving part. However, this bump at the top is the attachment site for several posture controlling muscles. And the bump at the bottom is another attachment site for posture controlling flow switch muscles. So they're called the trochanters, uh, the major and the minor. And uh, at one spot we have, uh, we kind of expect to find the pulling force exerted by the slow twitch muscles on the femur and the uh, uh, similar action, pulling action, tensile forces exerted on the lesser trochanter. And these two sides are connected by a broad band of very uniform and co-oriented trabecular elements. So, that is another bit tougher because if you have a pulling action in one side and a pulling action in the other position, then it's what? It's a tensile structure, right? It's a piece of bone that is operating in tension. That was unexpected. Uh, so, to, to make sure that we're not inventing anything and in, in, uh, using this method, we had to validate it using perhaps a similar uh, anatomical site but loaded in uh, different conditions. And uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, to acquire uh, 3D images of uh, pathological samples of, of, uh, of the human foot. So uh, in London, there is a very unique museum of pathology called the Gordon Museum associated with King's College London. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful place uh, with probably the vastest collection of pathology in England and maybe the second big, uh, largest in Europe. So uh, here on the second floor. And uh, I um, found uh, 
two unique preparations from, from the 19th century. One of them is called the uh, which is a congenital deformity uh, induced by abnormal uh, pull of uh, lower leg muscles that kind of twists the foot and uh, uh, orients the heel bone. So this person was never able to walk and the specimen was acquired upon the death of that young individual age 16. Uh, of note, Lord Byron also had similar deformity, but that's not the foot of Lord Byron. Uh, the, the second specimen is, of, um, is a different kind of pathology. It's a, a joint ankylosis. In this case, uh, this uh, individual aged 40 years uh, contracted an inflammatory disease of the foot uh, following some injury. And over uh, 20 years before uh, amputation, the bones of the foot fused together in one piece by a slow going chronic inflammation and inflammatory reaction. So uh, it was also not really a fun functioning foot. And uh, moving uh, around with a pathology like that could be compared to stepping on a peg leg. No self absorbing properties, very rigid. So both conditions are um, incompatible with the uh, normal walking that we are enjoying and sometimes taking for granted. So uh, it took some time and a very good student to make these specimens suitable for analysis because they were procured by, uh, by the museum before the time when x-rays were used uh, often in um, medicine and in pathology. And they were mounted, as in the case of the uh, club foot, using props and nails and wires. And these things, the next they look horrible. They cast shadows, they uh, have multiple artifacts. And uh, a student, Fu Lin Liang, uh, had to uh, segment them really fastidiously and train a neural net that helped us to get rid of the artifacts and produce reasonable uh, segmentation and uh, shape of individual bones. In the case of the uh, ankylosis, uh, the problem was different. You had to find the boundaries of individual tarsal bones and uh, recover them using a bunch of anatomical atlases. In any case, we had a, a suitable material for analysis. And uh, with my uh, lifelong passion to scan different bones, I had a, a good collection of normal human feet scanned uh, where uh, we uh, could look at the calcaneus, the heel bone, uh, that before death would experience a physiologic loading. We can compare it with the bone that, with the heel bone, same anatomical element that would be loaded once normally and then abnormally. And another specimen where a loading would be always abnormal or nearly absent. So again, if we look at a small fragment of a uh, trabecular fabric, uh, imagine we land with our uh, uh, anisotropy sampling probe at the round pore. There would be some elementary vectors that will cancel each other out and our net uh, uh, measure of anisotropy would be zero. Or if we have an, uh, uh, an element that has uh, clearly defined uh, orientation, we will have all the arrows adding up. And that would be our high anisotropy signal. Now imagine we are rastering this entire anatomical element, uh, spot by spot, cubic millimeter by cubic millimeter. So we will end up with a uh, vector map. And again, uh, around several million vectors. And for the uh, fragment, as I showed before, we can see the my direction. And uh, well, we can see that these two signals are quite independent from each other. For example, here we have a relatively low in the, in the central portion, the signal is blue, but in, in terms of direction, it shows as a, as a bundle of elements sticking out of the tree. So uh, these are parallel readouts. When we bring it back to the anatomical context, 
and look at a complete vector field by uh, magnitude and by direction, there are some interesting features. So uh, when we can uh, track a <coughs> sorry, clearly defined band of uh, high anisotropy uh, stretching from the uh, uh, articulated area that was housed towards the Achilles tendon. So the Achilles tendon was going this way, and this is a very defined band that has a uniform direction and high magnitude signal. There is also a dorsal band of also having defined the direction and a strong signal. There will be a tuberosity band also oriented towards uh, uh, the Achilles tendon. And this very out of plane band that uh, is associated with another uh, uh, tendon pulling upwards called the peroneus. So uh, again, amongst these four dominant anisotropic trajectories, we can uh, distinguish uh, two compressive uh, bands and two tensile bands. Uh, and they're consistent with the paradigm of uh, human locomotion on two. Uh, of note, but using this rastering method, we can measure not only an isotropy, but in a simpler way, we can also map the porosity or volume fraction. And uh, it gives another dimension of uh, uh, variability. <coughs> so, for example, uh, if we compare for the same bone, the anisotropy map and volume fraction map, we can find areas where anisotropy is low, but the volume fraction is very high, or both are high, such as in the in the or areas where anisotropy is high, but volume fraction is low, and both are low, for example. So these are independent metrics. We can uh, take them as uh, uh, separate dimensions for analysis. Now let's have a look at three non-pathologic human heel bones. So they pretty much uh, show quite recognizable uh, anisotropy pattern. We can identify the same four bands, two compressive, two tensile bands. And uh, well, the absolute values may vary, just like uh, human bodies may vary in terms of uh, frame and height and body weight and occupation. Uh, but if we put into comparison, let's say another uh, normal bone, which is similar to the other three, and also two pathological specimens, then the difference uh, pops out at you. The club foot that may experience physiologic loading and no traces of uh, uh, reproducible anisotropic trajectories. It's a, it's a patchwork of randomly oriented trabecular elements. Overall, anisotropy is low, and so is uh, bone mass or uh, volume fraction. In the amphilotic calcaneus, we do guess that, oh, here is the dorsal band, but beyond that, there is not much. So uh, an isotropy uh, pattern recognizable in all four uh, nor physiologically loaded heel bones is vanishing in this case over 20 years since the pathology kicked in. Do you have any questions? So I will summarize this part uh, that uh, the inner structure of bones is uh, continuous with tendons and muscles that operate the skeleton. At normal bones are all alike and every abnormal bone is abnormal in its own way, to paraphrase the Anna Karenina principle. Uh, we can reconstruct the loading pattern by looking at the microarchitecture, but we should be uh, aware of the multidimensional character of this adaptation landscape, because beyond the uh, classic uh, three dimensions of X, Y, Z, and the time over which uh, adaptational changes accumulate, uh, we also have an isotope by magnitude, an isotope by direction, volume fraction that doesn't depend on, uh, on the other uh, six. And uh, if I have time, I can tell you another story. Yes. Yeah. So, do you think that um, this is a good thing to do for working at home quality? So, I'm just going to add something to the entire 
Yes. Yeah. Quality measure? Yes. We hope so. Right. Uh, it, that's a short answer. The long answer is. Uh, we can hear the questions from the room. So oh, okay. The phone so they can hear. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Green would just ask whether uh, um, anisotropy in 3D would be helpful uh, in um, assessments of bone quality. And uh, the, the answer is that we should understand that uh, in, in biology, the, uh, we often have the Goldilocks principle, not too much, not too little, just right. So if bone texture is a very uh, general and non-specialized, it would be good in specific tasks, uh, monotonous, repetitive activities, such as walking or you know, some sorts of labor or, or sports. But if um, activity pattern is very monotonous and very uniform, then bone adaptation will go too far at the expense of being generally good in all other atypical loading scenarios. So for example, if uh, somebody is uh, loading their bones strictly vertically by let's say sitting and using the elevator, they will score not so well if they will fall on the side, right? Because that will be an unexpected uh, mode of loading. The good news are that uh, these um, changes in bone texture accumulate over decades. And if we can catch them early, maybe there is a way to, let's say, diversify loading patterns, diversify lifestyle, and uh, um, ensure the optimal combination of uh, generalism and spatialism in the bone fabric. Mm -hmm. This is a question. Yeah. So can you do this type of analysis with like my foot without me having to drop my leg off and give it to you? Like while it's still attached to me and while I'm still alive? <laughs> uh, at, at a low resolution, and uh, let's say, well, we optimize the, uh, the method with uh, having a voxel size of 50, mi uh, 50 micrometers. Uh, we see now that at 100 micrometers, we can, we can observe it perfectly fine. Now, in vivo uh, scans uh, give you something, some resolution uh, between 100 and 300 uh, micrometers per voxel. So, uh, and they're noisy. So, if let's say we can denoise them and we can extract the major trabecular uh, patterns, then yes, or, or we would be capable of uh, learning about your activity pattern in the past decade. Another question? Last question. Yes? It, it would seem that um, <clears throat> you might have access to museum samples that have um, extreme muscle atrophy or contraction, which yeah. could put all of the kind of loading streams. I'm thinking about the rocking chair. Oh, yeah. Skeleton. It, that would be a, a good validation. Muscle. Good. Uh, it, loading of yeah, if it, we have to know what, what was the actual loading, not just a, uh, a vague uh, description. Uh, Mark is asking about uh, our favorite specimen in the Maud Abbott Medical Museum. Uh, and if you haven't been there, you must visit the Maud Abbott Medical Museum because it's a, it's a, it's a phenomenal place. So there is a skeleton that uh, uh, has the uh, legs kind of curled into into a steep arch. That person wasn't mobile. Uh, that person was probably bound to a wheelchair or a bed. And a very uh, succinct uh, label, again, from the middle of 19th century, uh, calls that individual a, a, a village idiot and interpret it the way you like. Maybe it was a mentally impaired person. Maybe it was a, a, a Oh, well, some some other pathology that uh, didn't allow precise diagnostics. So we don't have any motion capture from the 19th century. We can only guess uh, what the muscle attachment sites tell us, what uh, general bone morphology hints from modern anthropological studies or something like that. But it is pretty much uh, uh, guesswork. I may be looking at animals that uh, practice different modes of locomotion, such as apes, uh, brachiating apes or knuckle-walking apes. Uh, uh, that would be a, a, a good sample to look at.
So <clears throat> earlier in your presentation, you talked about how people look at uh, like fossils, for example, look at the uh, muscle attachment sites, try to infer the, the how how the bone is loaded. Um, so how much of this of this trabecular like structure is still present in fossils that you could look at and use this on something like older than the the prerequisite for successful analysis is a good quality image. Mm -hmm. So when you have um, a dry, nice specimen that you put on the scanner and uh, scan at your convenience with the exposure time you like and the uh, voltage you, uh, you find most appropriate, it, it's not a big deal. You can do that. That's why I'm saying that zoological collections will be uh, maybe first first go for us. But if if you take a, a specimen that uh, is filled with sediment, or that is partially deformed by uh, 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 soil, uh, we may have a hard time uh, analyzing, the, uh, the distinguishing where is bone tissue uh, petrified, fossilized, and where is the filler in the pores. Mm -hmm. So if we can do that, and likely we can, there's some labor investment with the help of neural nets uh, for uh, image analysis and uh, denoising, uh, then uh, that's a that's an exciting uh, uh, avenue for us. Thanks. Yeah. Um, is there a reason why, for having more known samples, you have to go so far into history and and not have more recent samples that would maybe have a better description of uh, muscle attachment? These samples uh, are extremely rare today because uh, they were procured before the advent of public health care and before the time of antibiotics. It's difficult to imagine that somebody would uh, have a chronic inflammation that would receive no attention and no treatment over two decades. Or if somebody is born with a malformed uh, foot and wouldn't be prescribed an orthopedic boot or some physiotherapy. So today, pathologists like that uh, are, are impossible to find for good ethical reasons. They are taken care of. <laughs> I guess I have, you know, as a sort of like a more uh, motivated personally, you know, they, they tell all women of a certain age to do strength training. So mm -hmm. and, uh, because of our to improve bone quality. Yes. So is there, could you actually see that? Would you actually be able to make recommendations on what kind of strength training would be most effective, you know? I, I don't have any uh, quantitative evidence to, to tell you that. I, 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 I abs I'm absolutely convinced. And it's just a matter of uh, uh, Benjamin staying focused on his PhD <laughs> and uh, getting, the, getting the data. <laughs> OK, Benjamin, you're responsible for my future health now, you know? So. No, but it, uh, I, I think if you just uh, kind of believe in it and, and, and uh, but that doesn't yeah, exercise so specifically, you know, like whether some exercises would be better for one person versus other exercises for another person, or whether it doesn't really matter, just anything was going to be good. You know? Well, I would apply the EDI principle to exercise, yeah. like uh, a little bit of everything mm -hmm. for diversity, for inclusion of all bones and all muscle groups. <laughs> <laughs> what about the um, Texas bone repository? Is that what you're talking about? No. Is that lifestyle uh, documenting bones? Perhaps, yes. Yeah, so today we can have access to uh, diverse uh, collections, skeletal collections that can have uh, uh, hundreds of individuals with a complete biological profile uh, that it would include uh, body height, body weight at the time of death, uh, sex, so uh, cause of death. Uh, health status, like major ailments, or uh, maybe a little bit of lifestyle. But for the lifestyle, we can also use the proxies that conventionally um, biological anthropologists and archaeologists use for learning about uh, uh, preferential loading patterns. Like if somebody is throwing an axe, the, then they will have the rotator cuff muscle attachment sites more pronounced. If somebody is using some symmetrical activities, such as females in early sedentary cultures, they will have small muscle attachments in the forearms, uh, overdeveloped mm -hmm. at the expense of a uh, uh, lower body. So there are some more uh, uh, indicators of which muscle groups receive uh, more loading and leave their imprint in bones 
by um, accruing um, higher rugosity at the muscle attachment sites. Mm -hmm. So we, we can combine the uh, high techy methods with the millions of vector, uh, vector uh, maps and uh, classic uh, anthropology approaches. <laughs> Tennis, tennis, player. tennis player has 30% of in their tennis hitting other than in their lives. Mm -hmm. So very obvious from the non regulated muscular fibrosis. And then, then it makes sense to just build as much bone mass as you can. So you have. Well, okay, it's 1245, so it's 15 minutes. I don't know how much you have in your second story. <clears throat> you want a story? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's another bold story. And it, it is actually about simplify because uh, 5 million vectors per anatomical uh, map is something that you can be very skeptical about. Uh, go present it in a paper. So if we simplify everything to infinity, uh, what can we do? Uh, take a chunk of bone, isolate a small uh, subsample, and uh, inscribe a line, a centroid, into every trabecular element. And to remind you, this uh, single trabecular, there are about oh, two, 200 micrometers uh, thick and about one millimeter, say, uh, in length. And uh, we can easily replace a small quasi cylindrical body with a centroid. So then we add other centroids to other trabecular elements and continue building this constellation uh, until uh, we get a skeleton of the skeleton. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, pretty much a uh, well, the graph or topology uh, of a trabecular bone. Uh, and the beauty of it is that we can have thick struts or thin struts, but as long as we don't make holes and don't disconnect uh, different <clears throat> elements, their topological pattern is the same. And uh, uh, you can play with the morphology, but topology is kind of the uh, <laughs> bare bones, <laughs> not intended. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, to by way of analogy, how can we use that for learning about the function? Well, look at the look at the chair, uh, the topology of a chair uh, with having a seat, a back support, and four legs is telling us that it's good for sitting uh, in a, in the field of gravity. And uh, chairs could have different design and uh, different extent of fanciness, but as long as they have four legs and a seat, uh, uh, you can use them as as a chair. And then if something goes wrong and you lose the seat, you cannot use it as an, uh, any, anymore as a piece of furniture because it may topple and not fulfill the function. So uh, uh, to, this network analysis allows us to ignore the variations of um, elements shape and size and uh, scale uh, and just look at, at the uh, principal uh, blueprint. So uh, it's like a, a stick figure uh, drawing by children, right? You have a head with two eyes and uh, 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 arms with five digits. So it's easy to analyze uh, uh, if you have a, a stick figure because you can say, well, my every node is connected to that many uh, adjacent nodes with the edges and uh, two edges, uh, edges emanating from the same node would have a, a certain angle separating them, uh, acute or obtuse angle. So uh, this is also good because once you describe this dominant motif of, uh, of, of, of a lattice or of a stick figure, you can extrapolate it on the uh, entire uh, assembly. Or for example, if we use uh, regular lattices and uh, look at 2D honeycomb, we describe one element and that would be Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, triple star with uh, uh, three uh, sticks emanating from a node separated by uh, 140 degrees, and you describe one of these motifs and you know everything about all uh, 2D honeycombs. They're all the same at the network level. And then to extend into 3D and construct the simplest uh, 3D lattice, you would use a, a, a tetrahedron as your motif because it's the simplest polygon that uh, is space filling. And uh, or we can build a diamond lattice. 
and also describe one uh, tetrahedral motif with uh, 109.5 degrees. Uh, we, we, we know everything about diamond particles. Now, uh, we humans uh, build things orthogonally. So we have uh, uh, trusses and ceilings and walls, and uh, they intersect at 90 degrees. So the closest approximation to a human build structure would be a lattice uh, of, of six connected nodes and with, a, with the angle of uh, 90 degrees. Now, what do we have in bones? So if you do this operation, again, on uh, hundreds of thousands of nodes, because there are that many uh, uh, the trabecular elements uh, in, a, in a typical, say, human large joints, uh, so we will find all motifs. We can find triple <coughs> nodes, quadruple nodes, quadruple nodes, and hexuple nodes. <laughs> and uh, uh, the interesting part of it is that it's a pretty sparsely connected system. Uh, the dominant motif is actually nodes of three, followed by uh, less than two, uh, one quarter of the nodes of four elements. Uh, rarely you can find a node of five, and nodes of six are likely an artifact of your image processing. So if we uh, uh, add together the weighted contribution of uh, nodes of every coordination number, uh, according to, to their abundance, the average connectedness of bone uh, graph in trabecular bone and a mature uh, human, for starters, it would be uh, less than the diamond lattice uh, and uh, much less than the uh, orthogonal lattice or what a human engineer would do. So uh, to describe it, uh, simplify it even further, uh, if we look at the sag of this graph of node abundance, we can describe it with a uh, e to the power uh, negative one and a half and that's the kind of decay coefficient for the node abundance so uh, uh, we found that uh, at the uh, at the weizmann institute a long time ago very proud found like an interesting motif that was uh, uh repeating itself in uh, different individuals and different areas of the same uh, uh, femur and then I was working on another food project in England, and I looked at uh, uh, Chinese food binding. Uh, uh, and these bones, uh, like the feet of the affected individuals, they were loaded in a in a quite a, a abnormal way. But uh, there was no historical record of uh, foot bound ladies fracturing their heel bones. And we found the same topological principle, the same connectedness, same network parameters. They had all sorts of anisotropy, bone mass problems, but the, the uh, blueprint was preserved, was interesting. And then we looked at a different animal, that uh, famous pig from slide number three, and found that also the pig um, uh, femur and the uh, uh, pig mandible in the, in the kind of the head of, of the mandible where we did find some trabecular bone, there was the same distribution of angles. So we started then uh, feeling nervous with my uh, collaborators. Like, how are we analyzing something that is worth spending time on? And then uh, uh, colleagues from another school applied our newly described method to sea urchins uh, and uh, found also the same principle. In the sea urchin porous uh, structure of the exoskeleton, the struts are connected uh, preferentially at 120 degrees, and the most dominant number uh, uh, um, um, uh, type of a node is uh, triple node. So uh, somehow nature uses the same thing for uh, uh, pigs, humans, sea urchins. We also checked uh, uh, oak bark, uh, which is a portal structure. And guess what? Same principle, 3.8 connectedness of the network. Hmm. Uh, so then I, I was fortunate to work with a, uh, with a PhD student at McGill. Uh, called Amar al Shagri, who is now hired by the Dragonfly people. And uh, he helped me with a, a simulation study of uh, imaginary lattices, trying to figure out what, is this, uh, what does it mean to have average connectedness of 3.8. So uh, Amar designed a, a native lattice that was overconnected, like a human made structure that uh, connected to uh, average co connectedness five. And then uh, we ran this mother of all lattices into series of optimization processes, loaded and simulation, 
see which elements are idle, throw them away, run it again, and then kind of discarding of uh, idle elements or uh, in packets of, uh, you know, uh, 200 out of uh, 50,000 to begin with. And uh, uh, we also agreed uh, uh, ahead of time, uh, uh, what are the milestones? Where do we stop? When the number of elements goes to a certain value or when uh, the structure looks like bone or when the structure starts breaking in simulation too soon. And uh, uh, we took as a starting point the uh, network structure of a human femur, got this uh, lattice of uh, simulation, extracted only the nodes, uh, kind of forgot about the edges, just the nodes with their coordinates, uh, reproduced by, uh, by distribution function, the same randomness, the same probability of find a neighbor within a certain radius, and then reconnected them, uh, every node to five nearest neighbors. So that was the mother of all lattices that entered the cycle of uh, uh, evolutionary refinement. And uh, oh, so we have reference of both the mother of all lattices and then the lattice that showed most uniform stress distribution as generation one and the collective length of all the edges equivalent to that in bone but connected differently and the total number of edges as in in the reference lattice generation three so we looked at the, at the sag of the connect connect or node abundance as well and the, in the overconnected uh, lattice there was a linear relationship. And then as we uh, threw away uh, edges, we got closer and closer to the uh, typical uh, uh, bone lattice uh, refined by a uh, few millions of years of uh, uh, evolution. So uh, here is the, the result of the study. Um, all green circles are natural uh, bone lattices from multiple individuals and they have the same connectedness they have different number of elements they have different pore sizes different mass obviously different than isotropy don't even ask about it but the, the, the basic uh, uh, parameter the foundation the lattice connectedness is is the same and this is what we started with the mother of all lattices and then generation one two and three and you expect that uh, our connectedness decay coefficient will be going uh, towards what we see in the natural reference uh, family of lattices. Oh, good. Now, here is the uh, stiffness uh, test. If we normalize the uh, stiffness of the lattice to the weight of the whole assembly, it looks like the naive the mother of all lattices with five connections per node is not the stiffest it's kind of heavy but it's not the most uh, economical for the for the weight and if you want to design a lattice that will resist uh, deformation at uh, having the lowest weight that would be generation one while the rest goes down on a slippery slope and because there is no inflection in the graph and the simulation could continue it until the system disintegrated in um, abacus. It means that bones are not designed for the highest stiffness. It must be something else. And that uh, magic uh, parameter turned out to be the contribution of bending to the deformation of individual elements. So here we have the mother of all lattices, generation one, generation two. And we see that as we get rid of elements, the uh, contribution of bending kind of increases marginally, but doesn't change pretty much the behavior of the structure. And once we get rid of sufficient number of connections, then the bending contribution skyrockets. So instead of evenly loaded in uh, uh, tension or compression, we will have bending in the system. Why is that important? This is important because uh, if you want to break anything, you should do that in bending and not in tension or compression. Imagine the toothpick, uh, try break it in compression, you will injure your fingers. But in bending, it's very easy. So any known material is by an order of magnitude weaker in bending 
or torsion in comparison with tension or compression. So the moment uh, you, you get into that part of the graph, then uh, uh, with the same amount of material, but with that kind of pattern of connectedness, the structure becomes bending dominated and it is unreliable. So trabecular bone is thus uh, adapted by evolution for stretch domination at the lowest weight. And uh, it is designed apparently for stability during movement. And uh, that's the end of the second story. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Some other questions. Some other questions from those who are online. Can you hear me? If you want to ask, a, put a question in the chat, go ahead or unmute. Also go ahead. Somebody in the room. Um, that perfect structure of bone, do you think it's going to be different in different conditions of pressure, like uh, less gravity or in really, really deep oceans where a fish won't have bones, but if they had, do you think it would still have the same structure? Or same structure in the oaks? See, or another colleague, I didn't show that, but somebody checked uh, osteodentin and chimera. You know who chimeras are? Uh, deep water scavengers, relatives of sharks. And they have uh, trabecular dentin because they um, feed on whale carcasses and other tough stuff, right? So you need really a lot of pressure plus deep water, extreme conditions. And guess what is their connectedness angle? It's something that is bouncy and reliably conveys all the loads through all the elements in the system uh, axially, avoiding the bending component. So it is, uh, I don't think we can use it for that diagnostics of pathology or uh, identifying lifestyle because it's, it's a very fundamental and conserved uh, uh, motif shared among different clades of organisms. I was wondering if this is actually going to lead to how you should better build to resist earthquakes. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly different topic, but yeah. Other questions? Bill, then I would like to thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you for inviting me.